Welcome to the show. My name is Brett, and if you're watching this live, uh, thank you for being here. These are weekly live shows I do on DevOps, containers, Docker, Kubernetes, all things cloud native. So sometimes I have guests, sometimes it's just you, me, and we're having Q&A, and you ask questions, and hopefully myself or my guests have some good answers. So if you haven't been here before, this show is sponsored by you, all you wonderful patrons. Thank you so much. Uh, you can just go over to patreon.com slash Brett Fisher. And you don't have to give me any money, but if you'd like to buy a coffee, you get some extra benefits for that, including a monthly DevOps, DevOps hangout that we have. But if you don't want to give any money or you can't right now, that's fine too. And just click the follow button right there on the page, and then you'll get weekly updates on all the open source I'm creating, all the blog posts, courses, YouTube videos, podcasts, all that stuff, right? So thank you so much for those of you supporting this show. I really appreciate it. It's what keeps us going. Uh, and I'm very excited this week to have on the show Liz the Gray from Twitter, Liz Fong Jones. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me on the show. It's been a uh, it's been in the works for a very long time. Yes, it's exciting. I'm I'm excited to get to talking about your background and I've followed you on Twitter for a while. If you don't know who Liz is, uh, she's a site reliability engineer, but a developer advocate, labor and ethics organizer. She has over 16 years of experience, and she's been doing much of stuff at Google. But now she's at Honeycomb and talks about, I mean, just recently talking about shifting Kafka stuff in production, using new Graviton instances. So uh, you're on Twitch. You're all over the place. It's And it's great to have an SRE on the show and get into some of this observability. So uh, let's yeah, do it. <laughs> I always love talking shop. Let's do it. Yeah. So for those of you watching live, if you have any questions while we're, the whole reason we're doing this live is so that we can get your questions and ask them. We're going to talk about Honeycomb, obviously, a lot. And what is observability? That's going to be one of my first questions. Um, we've also got a book that Liz and the gang over at Honeycomb have made. Uh, I'm just going to show this on screen real quick. Yeah, it's uh, called Observability Engineering. And it is about how to make your systems more observable so you can move faster as an engineering team. And uh, there is a link that Brett has brought up that is how to get a free copy if you don't have a O'Reilly uh, Safari subscription. But if you do, you can get uh, the book via O'Reilly Safari without having to uh, give us your uh, name and email. Yeah. Uh, I'm definitely going to be getting that in the long list of, of O'Reilly books that I never finish reading. <laughs> but uh, this is the kind of stuff that I, I love because I I still feel like I'm super basic and new to observability. Um, you know, it's one of those things where uh, it's it's a evolving practice and I am still, I still, even though how, no matter how better, how much better engineering we get into our observability, I feel like I still am just new at this stuff. So before we even get started, um, how did you get started and like, so you got a background in SRE and stuff like that. Like, tell us a little bit about about that background. Yeah. Um, so I started engineering and hacking on systems uh, a very long time ago, and I started doing it professionally when I was seventeen years old. Um, I started helping school teachers produce a math textbook, and then I became a uh, a DevOps type at a game studio, and I joined Google in 2008, and I've been officially an SRE since, since then. Um, but I definitely feel like I was doing a lot of those similar things even before I joined uh, Google and, and officially became an SRE. So kind of what brought me to this area was wanting to learn what makes systems tick and to learn how to build them better so that we can have reliable services that are sustainable to operate for uh, that way, both developers have a good time running it and users benefit. Nice. The um, So the thing you focus on now is Honeycomb, right? And that, for some reason, people talk about this all the time. Like I see a lot of traffic of, on Twitter of people talking about Honeycomb. Uh, I, I haven't had the luxury of using it myself, but um, wh what caught your eye with Honeycomb? Like uh, The team there, obviously, I hear a lot of things about uh, some of the team there. So what was that about? Yeah, when I was looking to leave Google, uh, I wanted to continue my work of helping people make their systems more operable to make their systems uh, better. And I'd been doing a lot of work on Google's own observability tooling, although we weren't calling it observability at the time. Um, and what I was seeing in the state of the art publicly outside of Google was 
pretty sparse um, in terms of people that were doing distributed tracing in APM well, that were kind of integrating that into large scale efforts where it wasn't just, you know, hey, like let's pop open an individual trace versus like, let's look at the collection of everything that's happened and find you the most interesting and relevant traces. Mm. Um, so, you know, definitely I, I will admit, right, like I haven't publicly admitted that I looked at both, you know, at companies like Datadog and Lightstep and, and Honeycomb, right? And I settled on Honeycomb. And I think part of that was that the Honeycomb founders, the Honeycomb engineering team really wanted to welcome me as a, as a stakeholder rather than, you know, you are going to be a talk giving robot who goes around the world giving talks about our, our wonderful product, right? Like, no, like I, I, I am here to kind of push, push the boundaries and push the boundaries of the product. That's kind of the kind of role that I wanted. So. Yeah. And I, and I feel like you kind of, you, you all talk, walk the walk, right? Like I see a lot of uh, stuff out there about what you all are doing in production. Your talks are about yeah, what you all we, do with your own software. Yeah, we work in public and that's very important to us because a lot of people don't believe us when they say, you know, life can be so much better and they're like, prove it. And we're like, great, like here are the receipts, right? Like here, here's what we have actually done, but this is how our engineering team of, you know, at the time it was a dozen people. Now it's more than that. Uh, we're nearing 50 engineers, but like this is how we, you know, go head on against companies that are 10 times their size is because we have a much more productive engineering team because we have embraced observability practices ourselves. Yeah. And for those, uh, one of the things I was really curious about um, was what is what does the typical onboarding look like? Because I, so I spend part of my time as a consultant and I'm, I'm always working with teams that are sort of onboarding themselves to the cloud native way. And so I see a lot of the beginner path. I don't, you know, I don't, <laughs> Netflix doesn't hire me to make Netflix better. It's, it's the other companies and that are sort of just now getting it. And I'm very curious about how do they, how does the relatively immature team that's, you know, their first couple of years of containers, they're still struggling a little bit with distributed computing concepts. Is that like, I'm sure you get all kinds, but what does the onboarding look like for something like Honeycomb and observability for a team like that? Yeah, I think that it is much easier when you are starting and adding observability from the beginning rather than trying to bolt it on afterwards. Um, and there are definitely a number of ways that we do have and that the community as a whole has developed, not just Honeycomb, to make it easier to onboard. So for instance, with open telemetry, which is a common standard that we're working on alongside our competitors, um, if you wouldn't mind pulling up OpenTelemetry.io in your browser. Um, so that's basically a mechanism for people to egress telemetry to any observability provider they like and to have that telemetry automatically collected, especially if you're using a uh, framework like, like Java Spring or if you're using uh, Rails, right? Like there's all kinds of integrations that just collect the data that you need to get started with out of the box. The analogy that I make is that, you know, you can't go anywhere in distributed tracing land. Like it's like, it would be like walking around without a skeleton, right? Like you kind of have to have like bones in, or else you're going to fall over, right? Um, so I think that that's kind of the basics of, can you understand when requests are coming into and leaving your service? That's kind of the basics that you have to do. And those are things that you're generally interested in as a developer anyways, and Otel makes it easy for you to collect that info. And then after that, then you start layering on additional things, right? Like you start layering on, okay, let's add application specific attributes. Let's add in additional metadata. Uh, and that's kind of how you get to that richer picture of what things should look like. Nice, I'm sorry, did you did you give me a URL that you wanted me to? Yeah, opentelemetry.io. Okay, right. So you can see uh, that, you know, we, we contribute to it, but so do like a large number of our competitors. Um, so you can see that, for instance, uh, you'll, you'll see that there are folks from New Relic contributing, people from uh, Splunk, from Datadog, from Lightstep. Like it's, it's really a whole bunch of people that work together to, uh, in the metaphor, right? Like we, we all come together and we build this, this, this barn. Nice. I think I'm trying to remember. I think I might have had another Docker captain on the show last year, and we kind of talked about observability. It was kind of my introduction to how exactly you know that and open telemetry ideas are different from just what we all just thought of as traditional monitoring. And um, and I, of course, I've already forgotten a lot of these things. So it's glad to have this refresher. Um, the for a lot of so it sounds like for a lot of the teams that I work with. The thing that they really struggle with is is the 
metrics inside their application part, right? That they're not used, they're used to traditional teams. It seems like they're used to external tools, to, but you know, they put in like an APM module inside their app and suddenly it lights up their code so that they didn't have to actually create their own metrics, but it, it always becomes like an ops role to try to figure that the, in the traditional right, exactly. where ops is that. I think that's kind of the feedback loop, right? Like the feedback loop is you own your instrumentation, you write more, you look at it in production, it tells you interesting things about your service, right? Like it's not, it's no longer a thing of you hand this over the walls to the ops team and the ops team uses APM to figure out what the heck you are doing. Um, right. Instead, it's a, we empower you to ask questions about your own code in terms that you understand. Nice. Yeah. And I, I, for the teams I've seen doing that, it re I really enjoy that approach r rather than trying to brute force it from the other side. Cause I, that was my role all those years ago. was <laughs> always so trying to, well, let's see if we can throw something in there to see the number of requests happening when it doesn't really come out of the app itself. Um, so when we talk about Honeycomb, what, like, what's the elevator pitch for what it does and doesn't do? Cause sometimes I, it's hard with a lot of these different tools to understand their differences and their advantages and stuff. Yeah, um, I think the simplest way is definitely to see it, um, but to kind of do the quick elevator pitch, Honeycomb is a tool that lets you understand your distributed systems in real time by asking questions, by slicing and dicing data and getting any visualization that you need all in one tool. Not in, you know, related tools of the same product suite. We mean one tool, one view, kind of seamlessly flipping back and forth between an aggregate view of what's going on in your system as a whole. And let's drill down into that specific trace that had that latency at that time. Let's find out what's different about it and which other ones are are in that bucket too, right? So right. one of the things that I can show you if you want to uh, go ahead and pull up my screen is yeah. this is a view of Honeycomb. Uh, of, of Honeycomb. And this is all the traffic e uh, ingressing into Honeycomb right now. So you can see here, for instance, that there's a deploy that happened about uh, 30 minutes ago, right? And if I wanted to understand what's the proportion of requests running in that uh, across build IDs, right? I can just type in, you know, group by build IDs, right? And it'll show me, okay, what happened there, right? And I can see, okay, yeah, you know, I had the old build went away, the new build came in, everything's working well. But do I really know that it's working well? Well, let's do a heat map on duration. And now we can see, okay, so it looks like latency was basically unchanged, right? Old build, new build, that seems fine. So we can also do things, not just uh, kind of system level things or like build level things, but we can also do this by individual, uh, by individual tenants, right? So I can go ahead and do this by data set ID. I can go ahead and slice and dice, right? Like very, very quickly, right? Like you can see, this is the aggregate traffic now summed up together. And this is the number of people doing these varying things. And I can even, uh, even if I don't know which data set I'm looking for, another thing that I can do is I can say, who is in this slice of customers that are particularly slow, right? Who is disproportionately represented here? Mm. And this is kind of our take on on AAOps, right? Except for instead of having like Skynet telling you, hey, this line wiggled, like I think I should wake you up. Instead, like we are aiming to give you a mecha suit, right? Like we'll tell you what's going on inside of your application. And I think that that's particularly magical, right? So I think what's interesting is, is here, right? like there are a number of users that are disproportionately slow and a number of users that are, that are reasonably fast. So let's look at just this one user, for instance, that is disproportionately slow. Huh. A lot of the requests are taking around, uh, around what, 30 milliseconds, 40 milliseconds. Let's look at one of those requests, right? Let's find out why is this so slow? And it turns out, okay, we're spending uh, seven milliseconds parsing the protobuf. They actually sent the data over the wire pretty fast to us. So we might want to maybe speed up our protobuf parser. I don't know. And then after that, like they're just sending a lot of events in the batch and each individual event is pretty fast. So this customer is actually probably fine. Like this, this customer on a per event basis is fast enough, even though it looks like they're super slow, this is actually just, just good batching, right? Um, so that's the kind of thing that we're able to very rapidly drill and identify as well as also kind of see in one place, uh, let me shift this back over to, uh, to the metrics about ingest. Right. 
to very easily be able to see, okay, how am I doing on CPU utilization? How am I doing on memory? How am I doing on network connections? Um, this view actually makes a little more sense if I look at seven days because then it'll smooth out. Right. So this is what we mean when it's like one tool. It's like not a suite of tools. It, this is, this is one tool that helps us. Whoa, that's interesting. What happened there? Like they, they sent us suddenly three times as much data. I wonder if this is a like Black Friday, Cyber Monday thing or like <laughs> what's going on. Like this, this is the really cool thing about Honeycomb is that you will discover things every single day, right? Like you will discover things that you couldn't have found out about your, about your data any other way. Right. Okay. So I can even like just actually specifically ask like what's going on with these? Right. And it will very specifically tell me very quickly, like what's, what's happening with this particular customer's traffic, right? That ability to kind of dive in, that's what we think is unique. And that's what we think you need to have in order to understand a modern distributed system. Right. Um, we've got some questions in, uh, biker. Hello. Um, I think kind of asking about the difference between, uh, like how is APM analytics different from honeycomb observability that I think we kind yeah, of Yeah, right. Like this is <laughs> this is kind of almost what we define as modern APM, right? Like yeah. this is something that is that enables you to understand multiple systems, not just one system, and allows you to kind of not have separate views of APM, but instead to integrate APM into your over or to integrate tracing into your overall workflow. Uh, oops, that is a a error. Well, now I have uh, now I have a, li a little challenge to to, to debug um, because we also have it's it's uh, it's our services all the way down. We have another copy of our services that also uh, is running Honeycomb that we can use to debug our dog food environment. So, yeah, fun times. Um, But what was the other question? Um, someone was comparing, asking to compare contrast with beta dog, I think. Um, so I think yeah. that's an, that's a really interesting question. Um, I think what that basically boils down to with regard to, to data dog is data dog is a fine product for understanding your metrics. They do have an APM lens or an APM suite, right? Like, but it's not necessarily well integrated, right? It's hard to jump from looking at metrics to looking at a trace to looking at a log, right? Like it, it adds time when you're resolving incidents as opposed to having something that just fluidly works and very, very quickly uh, for mm -hmm. debugging. All right. Um, Martin's asking, so is this what Justin Garrison and Chris Nova write about in their book, Cloud Native Infrastructure, when they write about cloud native applications? I'm not sure if he means your application or the kind of applications that Honeycomb would work with, but take both. Yeah, we, Honeycomb, I would say is definitely cloud native in, in some senses, um, right? Like we run entirely on EC2. We, uh, we are very scalable and elastic, right? Like we, uh, we adjust the size of our services, but also we are only starting our Kubernetes journey um, because up until recently, we were basically of the school of thought that like we use an entire EC2 virtual machine, right? Like we'll use, you know, eight cores, 16 cores, like per machine. We don't necessarily need containerization to slice things into, you know, two core or, or fractional core workloads and then pack right. them, right? That's not really our use case. Um, and also we only operate like, you know, half a dozen microservices. We aren't operating 100 microservices, 200 microservices, right? Like we're just massively horizontally scaling out. Right. Um, but we're, you know, here to solve problems with microservices in general, whether they be six microservices or 100 or 200, right? To us, it's that kind of jump of you need to be able to understand things past the boundary of a single application on a single machine to zooming out to look at all your infrastructure, all of your services. Um, so yes, we are for, uh, I, I, you know, you can say buy in for, uh, cloud native applications. Right. Right. And, but that doesn't mean, uh, I'm sure you, you know, we've all got legacy code and like you said, it's oh, the, starting from, fr fr you know, starting fresh greenfield, uh, is always ideal, but a lot of us have all these old apps and, you know, we always want them to be more intelligent and have more observability. So I'm assuming that. That you know that path is also a path for legacy applications to get into something like Honeycomb. 
Yeah, def definitely. If you're on a legacy application, chances are you're trying to do a monolith to microservice transition these days. Right. And if you're doing that, you really want to be able to understand how is the performance changing as I pull things out, right? How how is, how is performance changing as I as I migrate this workload to a cloud? How is this migrate? How is this workload changing as we substitute one dependency for another? Right. Like those are important questions you should be asking and be able to continue debugging. Yeah. The um... The question, uh, what about Elasticsearch? Garish, I'm not sure what, if you're asking if they support Elasticsearch? Um... Yeah, so Elastic does have a APM front end and they mm. also do operate, like you can use Elasticsearch as a backend for Jaeger or another distributed tracing service, right? Like there are people that are trying to build services adapted essentially from uh, logging, uh, log searches uh, into tracing. Mm -hmm. And it can be really challenging. Um, this is actually a chapter in our book that I've been working on the past the past week, which is explaining to people why older log search technology is not quite as effective at trace searches as, as one would like. Um, that it doesn't necessarily enable you to get results in seconds. Like it'll give you a result on, you know, all of your traces in 30 seconds, but to me, 30 seconds feels very, very slow, right? Right. Whereas in our case, we've written from the ground up a, a column store, although these days you could use something like, um, you know, you, you could you could use use uh, a another columnar, columnar store. Um, what's the one out of out of out of Yandex? Uh, it is uh, Clickhouse, right? Click out. Clickhouse is an example of a backend you could use instead. That would probably be a little bit more effective than Elasticsearch, but then you would have to build all the UI and visualization for utilizing it, right? Like that's mm. time consuming, that's expensive, right? Like there are so many things that Jaeger does, but there are so many things that Jaeger does not do. Jaeger will show you that single trace, but it won't necessarily help you analyze many traces. Um, so the answer is yes, you can kind of approximate starting to get there with Elasticsearch. Right, you can couple Jaeger uh, as a front end to Elasticsearch as a back end and get like a so so front end and a so so back end. Or someone could in the future couple, couple Jaeger to Clickhouse and get a so so front end on a great back end. Um, it, right, like, or part of our business proposition, at least, is, is we'll give you the whole thing, batteries included. Right. Batteries included. Oh, Martin's uh, refining his question. I mean, that the cloud native applications are supposed to export health data and then. And telemetry data. Yeah, yes. that's, that's what Otel is doing. Yes, Open Telemetry is is exporting that telemetry data in service of cloud native applications. Right. That that is why Otel is incubating under the CNCF because that is one of the main barriers that cloud native applications have. Right. Like is is that they introduce complexity unless you can understand that complexity and have it done like fairly automatically. It's hard to manage. So. That's where Otel comes in. You instrument your app with Otel. It's, it emits the telemetry data without you having to think about it too much. And then you send it to a service like Jaeger or Lightstep or Honeycomb. Oh, OK. Um, Maz, is that, uh, how do you compare Honeycomb to Pixie Lab? Ah, uh, yes. So Pixie is really exciting. Um, Pixie is a company that got acquired by New Relic, I think, a year, year and a half ago. And what they do is eBPF. Um, if you want to actually pull up the Pixie Labs homepage, uh, we, we can probably talk about that. Um, so basically, eBPF is the uh, extended Berkeley packet filter, um, which has like long since lost its actual meaning as to what a packet is. Um, but it's this mechanism of tapping into the kernel uh, in order to uh, in, in order to understand like what function calls are happening, what instruction calls, what sys calls are happening, mm -hmm. and to do it with very low overhead um, to be able to help you generate kind of stack traces in aggregate up about your application without instrumentation, uh, and because it's being done at the kernel level, right? It's just tapping at the kernel level, and in the case of Pixie, they they basically uh, install Kubernetes sidecar. So mm. I think it's really neat stuff, right? Like in that it is a mechanism for you to very easily um, have have something you can attach to Kubernetes pods and get data in aggregate. And then you can send it uh, actually funnily enough through the open telemetry collector. Um, so there's kind of this suite of things, right? Pixie is now a CNCF project. Uh, Flowmill is another CNCF project um, respectively donated by, uh, in this case, New Relic donated Pixie and, uh, 
think Splunk donated Flowmill, right? Mm. So basically this technology for manipulating eBPF data and transmitting it from your Kubernetes pods all the way all the way to a backend, um, like New Relic, right? So that's that's basically the val the value proposition. Um, is is instant access to to data, with the caveat that it's not going to give you granular data on a per request basis, right? It gives you aggregate data about where your 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 code is spending time, uh, right? So the right. idea is that it's always always on, and that it's relatively cheap from an overhead perspective, but it is um, not request level granular, but it is line of code level granular. I, I think it's this really interesting thing. Yeah, what we haven't seen yet is kind of the combination of these two approaches together, right? So Pixie is a kind of telemetry, right? I'm sorry, Pixie is a framework for producing uh, what we call profiling uh, type type signals. Um, so I think what New Relic is doing is really interesting, right? Like is they're saying, you know, you should have like these particular signal types. They've been pushing for a long time the idea that observability is metrics, logs, traces. Uh, I think like system change events, and now they're saying it's also it's also profiling. To me, I care about the outcome, right? What's the fastest way to resolve your problem? And many of these signals are useful. Many of them aren't, right? So mm. I think profiling is a very exciting signal. I think tracing is a very exciting signal. I think logging is on its way out. Um, I think that metrics are situationally useful, but not necessarily useful all the time, right? So it's not a, you must collect them all. You just have to have the right set of them. And I think what we are doing as an industry is iterating to figure out what the right set of signals is and what analysis capabilities you need, right? All the data in the world is useless. In fact, it's right. less than use useful because you're paying to store it. If you can't query it to get answers to your questions, you're not actually solving your problem. So right. I think we need kind of results-based observability. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's a very common question I get when I see people implementing any of these tools uh, is they're, they're looking, separating the wheat from the chaff, right? Like the uh, figuring out what metrics I should be looking at and which ones are relevant to me. And of course, some of that is very generic and some of that is very workflow specific, very, very much their app. Uh, but that that is, I feel like, that's like the journey that I see a lot of people struggling with, right? Is Okay, I got all these. Uh, now I've, I've enabled all the metrics. I've done all the things. Right, I've turned all the things in my vendor's product suite, but I still can't get answers. What's going on? And I think right. that brings us to the next subject I wanted to talk about, which is service level objectives, right? To kind of tie together and with a nice ribbon the idea of observability and SRE, right? Mm. SRE is about engineering systems to be more reliable, observability is about solving your problems faster. What if we could combine those two things together, right? What if we could both measure reliability in the same place as we debug our reliability? So this is where we have this idea of service level objectives as a thing that you should have inside of inside of your uh, in, inside of your your observability tooling, right? You should be able to measure and understand how am I doing with my business objectives, right? How am I doing with my goal that when a user types an query in Honeycomb, it should finish in less than 10 seconds, 99.5% of the time, right? So I can go and look at this and see how are we actually doing at this goal, right? And actually have a definition of this that is based on our telemetry data that says, you know, this is what our success criteria is, and this is how we define what's in and out of scope. And also to be able to see, because of this uh, machine assistance, which requests are succeeding, what's failing, what are the common properties, right? That when you start thinking about it, whoa, that's interesting. This one query is 8% of our failures. Let's look only at that, right? Like that's that's the kind of thing that really helps you unify the what's the business value of this versus um, versus, versus how do I then connect it all the way down to the system level and, and debugging it. Right. Right. So I can I can go all the way from, you know, hey. You know, I want 99.5% of requests to be successful to what's going on with this one request that is failing or this set of requests that is, that is failing, right? That's kind of, that really appeals to the SRE in me, right? Like, because it means that I have a much easier time talking at high level about, you know, these are our business goals. This is, this is the level of reliability we're trying to achieve. How do we actually, you know, how do we actually target that level of reliability rather than kind of being passive passengers in it, right? Like we shouldn't be right. looking at our SLOs every, you know, 90 days and saying, whoops, we blew it. What could have we done, right? <laughs> or looking at outages reactively. We should be proactively right. looking to understand, you know, what's happening. Why is this request taking 20, why is this request taking 27 seconds, right? And to me, it looks like 
basically most of the work looks like it's done in the first 10 seconds and then we're just sitting there waiting on some on on a thing that never reported back to us right that's that i think is 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 the way to think about and unify the disciplines of SRE and observability is to make it actionable um to make it to make it easier to understand right um that's like the ninja art of making it actionable <laughs> Uh, but it shouldn't be a ninja art. Everyone should be able yeah. to do it. And the way that you get to doing that is by having people uh, have high quality tooling that does that does what they need, right? As opposed to, well, I read this in the S3 book, but there's no way I could achieve this. I guess we're giving up on it, right? Like that's that's no fun. <laughs> right. <laughs> all the, I read about how all the cool kids are doing it, but we're not going to be able to do that. Yeah, that's that's no fun. Or worse, people trying to do it and failing because they're just trying to adopt something that's not like right for their context, right? You are not mm. Google probably, unless you're from right. Google and listening into this call, you are not Google. <laughs> right. Um, so we've got a couple of other questions. Uh, I think we've already covered the honeycomb versus new relic. Um, I mean, versus all the tools, right? Like this is all the, <laughs> this is what, this is the standard question everyone asks is how do, how do I make, how do I choose? Right. Um, uh the answer is you shouldn't have to choose, right? Like use open telemetry and tee the data off to all of these data sinks. You can compare side by side, right? Like there's a reason why all of these tools have free tiers that you can just try it out, right? And I think that that enables you to see what business value you are getting from each and, and make a informed decision. Um, right. Instead of me. So that's one of the challenges too, is traditionally I would see developers adding logic for metrics that were very specific they would only work on the one platform they were writing it for right and yeah, so yeah, yeah. so now their now their code is completely tied to one cloud service for any of their mostly this is for monitor this is for metrics not so much logging because i i feel like the logging standardization happened a little earlier than than the metrics stuff at least in my world um you you, you say that but on the other hand, I feel like logging standardized, but it also ossified in some really bad patterns, right? Like mm. we know today that you should write logs in a machine readable format, that they shouldn't be, you know, you shouldn't have new lines in your logs just scattered in there right. and just dump stack traces because it makes it impossible to parse, right? Like you have to have standards for formatting and validation of data so that you can ingest it so that you can, so you can slice it into columns and store it in ClickHouse or store it in, in a tool like Honeycomb, right? Like, otherwise you're having to use a tool like Cribble, uh, I think it's Cribble.io, C-R-I-B-L, right? Like you're using a tool like Cribble to kind of infer the format and, and, and yeah. transform it, right? Like you should just be writing it the correct way in the first place. Yeah, that's, uh, that goes, that takes me back to 12 factor, which is, I always, you know, when I talk to someone who's, they so it, it's part of their knowledge gap seems to be that they're not following a fundamental distributing concept that we've, those of us that have been reading manifestos and, and books for over a decade, kind of, that's just in our DNA. Um, I, I find that a lot of times when people haven't adopted those early concepts, uh, like 12 Factor gives us, then all these other things later on they really struggle with. Yeah, right? that's they, kind of the other never thing about walking, with... right? like walking and then running, right? Like uh, when people come to me and are like, you know, Liz, I, you know, super need observability or like I'm really excited about it. I, I ask them first, like the question of, are you able to deploy more than one time for two weeks, right? If you can't deploy more than one time for two weeks, like you should really think about improving your CI CD, right? Like you should really think about other things than, than trying to add in observability because like, the value proposition of observability is being able to have that fast feedback cycle, right? To add instrumentation, to see your code running in production, to add, then, you know, change your, your instrumentation or change your results, right? Or, right? Like, but if you are learning things about your code from looking at it in production after a three month delay, right? That, <laughs> that's a really long feedback cycle. You're better served spending that energy just making your release train faster first. Right. That's a really great point because it now makes me realize yeah, if you have the best of observability and you can detect problems in minutes because you're looking at it ahead of time, but it takes you two weeks to fix it because your process for getting new code into production is still very arduous and, and human yeah, intensive, yeah. Then, then what good is detecting it faster when it still takes you weeks to deploy code, right? Um, it's kind of putting the cart before the horse there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, let's see, any other questions? 
Google donated SQL com commenter to the CNCF. Yes. What does this solve? Yes. So the reason that we adopted SQL commenter as a open telemetry family project is that it is a transport layer solution, right? Like it is solving the problem of you have a bunch of SQL that's running in your database. You've got your slow query logs. But you have no way of correlating it to the application requests that generated those uh, generated those SQL statements, right? With SQL commenter, now you can, right? SQL commenter says, we're going to pass the trace ID and the tra and the span ID and the parent ID and the like source of this downstream into your into your SQL code as a comment, so that then you can extract it from your database logs and just add it as part of your trace, right? And that trace then will show in a tool like Honeycomb or, or Jaeger, right? Like you can you can then extract it and show the the SQL execution trace as part of the broader application trace that it, that it, that, that that caused it to happen. Um, so we're very much in Hotel land, all about making instrumentation easier and making propagation and, and analysis of traces easier, right? The downstream analysis piece and ingest of the data, that's kind of a concern of vendors or open source solutions, right? If there's plenty of choice there, but we want to make sure that there is high quality data. Otherwise, none of these tools make any sense. Yeah. So I did not know about this. This is really cool. I mean, just yesterday, I was helping a team with uh, d during a migration, a database, a table locking issue, and they were trying to chase down what exactly was causing the lock. And it was, it was very apparent that we didn't have the right tooling in place because it it was quite difficult. You know, basically shelling into servers and running SQL commands by by hand. Yeah, uh, it's definitely so a more advanced thing for sure, right? Like yeah. there are a lot of things you can detect just from client side instrumentation of your SQL queries. Like I was this morning looking at a customer's uh, traces um, in preparation for a workshop I'm doing with them. And I was like, wait a second, this customer is doing the same thing that we actually have in our demo app, which shows like you repeatedly calling MySQL with the same SQL statement, except for, you know, the, the ID you're fetching is incremented. And they were doing this 2000 times. And I was like, wait a second, like, you know, why are you doing, eh, 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 right? Like, right. so yeah, you know, there are a lot of things you can catch just from, uh, just from client instrumentation, but once you get those obvious ones out of the way, then you have to really have the data from the SQL trace as well. Nice. Thanks, Martin. That was a great, uh, great suggestion. Um, to talk about that. Would you recommend open telemetry? This is Conrad to get started here. Would you recommend open telemetry to get started here because i have worked for some companies and they have all the tools datadog and it becomes difficult to find answers yeah so i think it's two pieces right first you have to make sure that you are consolidating tools to the right set of tools that are actually helping you do the job and in order to solve that you need to make sure that you are able to compare and contrast different vendors to have vendor data portability right so i think otel solves the data portability problem as well as the kind of instrumentation ergonomics problem of making it as easy to add a printf debug statement as it is to add a trace span right or add a trace attribute so otel kind of solves the data quality issue but you know, you can have high quality data and be piping at 10 different places and paying for it 10 times and like not getting any insight, right? Like that, it, you have to kind of have those two issues solved, right? Data quality and picking the right tools to work with. Um, but if you're locked into a particularly bad set of tools that are not working for you, right? You're going to have to rip out the old stuff anyways. You may as well replace with Otel so you can comparison shop and, and not have to do any ripping and, and replacing in the future. Right. Um... That's kind of one of the, all the dreams, all the dreams of all the cloud native things is that we can rip and replace parts of our infrastructure uh, at almost at will. Uh, it never is that easy, but um, it's getting easier for those of us who have been around. I mean, I got some gray hair, so I've been doing this a long time. And like, uh, and when I look back at just 10 years ago, it's amazing how much of this infrastructure and tooling oh, yeah. we have that just 10 years ago would have been a pipe dream. It would just, you know, you'd have had to hire a, a Google sized team to do it for you. Um, does Honey Moss has another question? Does Honeycomb have alerting mechanisms? Yes. To notify the yes, SRE we do. Ones? Um, um, if you want to go ahead and pull up my screen again. So when we we encourage people to first set service level objectives up, right? So you define what more than usual means, right? We're not a big believer in moving averages or things like you know, hey, like notice anomalies, right? Like we're much more in favor of saying this is the customer experience our customers expect and to let us know if it's violated, right? So in this case, you can see that this alert is firing, right? And that this is a thing that took a turn for the wor dramatic worse yesterday. 
And you can see that the alerts are configured to go to Slack, right? So it's a thing where you absolutely can and should set from, you know, whatever your, your tool of choice is. Um, I think there is, where's the, or actually if I show the integration center, it's going to show API keys. I should not do that on stream. Um, <laughs> but like you can basically configure to go to pager duty. Yeah. Right. Um, so yeah, basically, basically, um, let's see in this triggers list, do I have E2E? Oh yeah, there we go. Yeah. So, right. Like if you send, if you send alerts to pager duty, then it'll wake someone up if your service level objective is in danger, right? We think that's kind of the preferred approach rather than just saying, you know, nebulously, like, let me know if latency increases by more than 15%. Congratulations, you've now set yourself up for getting paged at 2 a.m. because one request <laughs> has right. has happened that has a latency that's twice normal. Guess what? Your P50 went up by by 100% in the last five minutes. Oh my God, is this an emergency? No. Yeah. An emergency. Alert fatigue. That's my favorite topic. Yeah, um, <laughs> right. Like the way you get out of alert fatigue is service level objectives and error budget yeah. burn alerts. Yeah. Um, great question, Moss. Thank you. Are there any more uh, Bublon? Uh, sorry if I mispronounced that. Are there any more data getting ingested in? What are the best practices to analyze false alarms? As there are yeah. more and more data getting ingested, what is the best way? Or practices yeah, to I, yeah. I, yeah, I think the best way to think about um, false alarms is to, so we've in the past had some of our customers, right, that we know are not going to be performant, right, because of the type of data that they're sending or, um, or like the formatting or, or like what they're do what they're doing in particular, right? So we can exclude those from our service level objectives and say, right, like we know about this, we're going to deal with it later, but this is not something that's urgent, right? Yeah. Um, so I think in general, kind of those false alarms fall into two categories. Either number one, this is a thing you should not be alerting on in the first place, things like CPU usage of each individual host, right? Like why do you even care? Right. That that's a kind of false alarm where my answer is just shut it off. Right. The yeah. other category of false alarm is this is important knowledge to have, but it's not actionable. Right. And then you just exclude it from your things that are immediately paging you. I have seen people say, you know, yes, you know, let's do this AA ops thing. Let's use, I think, Big Panda or whatever to kind of, you know, scrape through all these 10,000 alerts and figure out which ones are, are relevant. 10,000 is not a very large number in machine learning land, and it's not <laughs> enough number to generate a good signal to noise ratio. You will drop alerts you needed to have. You will carry through a lot of false alarms anyways. It is much better instead to say, let's wipe the table clean. Let's just start by measuring customer impact. Let's start by measuring service level objectives. So start from the top level of customer ingress and work your way down through a system and debug as you need to, rather than have these 10,000 things at the bottom screaming through your attention that some like overworked AI is trying to sort out. Right. Um, coming from that ops background, I my my old habit is always to work from bottom up, you know, because i I've only I've always been so used to the metrics coming out of the app being inefficient or not sufficient. <laughs> uh, so I'm excited that we've got, especially when it comes to like the, the books. You, I'm sure this. Uh, what was it? The observability observability, observability engineering, engineering book. Um, I love that we're getting more uh, scriptive stuff like this that we can actually use to implement because I felt like the guidance has always been very vague and hand wavy in the past. And it's, you know, it's either super specific. Like uh, I love, I, one of the things I do love about conference talks is when people do sort of, um, uh, when, well, I'm sorry, the word I'm forgetting. When they, when they list all the things that they failed at, like all, all these are all the things we've done in uh, lessons learned sort of thing. Yeah, After the, the fact, don't work. yeah, yeah, and obviously those are you know those are you learn a lot from those, but they're very specific to a problem, and they're not really going to help you prescribe other than that you're like, oh, we might have that problem, we should do what they did. So um, the getting into getting more into these books that are very specific, like this is oh, look, go look at open telemetry, look at the standards and that this is creating, and use that as the, sort of the guiding. Instead of saying, yeah, let's just use KPIs. That. I actually, uh, I, I published, I think, two days ago, a, these are all the things that we tried to do with Kafka and failed. Um, you know, things things like, oh, you know, we were accidentally running a uh, years old version of Kafka, right? Because we were afraid of touching Kafka even to upgrade it. And therefore, we just, you know, let it sit. And we were not actually doing the bug fixes or, hey, like, you know, 
we were using this really inefficient instance type and it was costing a load of but a, a huge load of money in order to in order to pay for the Amazon Elastic Block Store, right? Like right. these are all things that you can learn from us. Um, or you can not have to worry about if you used a managed service, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. Uh, by the way, those of you uh, watching the uh, Liz is also on, we've talked about this early in the show, but uh, you stream live and you talk about your work, the technicals of it on Twitter. So if you're looking, if you're someone who's in, at all interested in this, definitely check her out on those. Platforms. Yeah, I'm doing uh, every day at 9 p.m. Pacific, I'm doing a stream of Advent of Code, which is a yearly uh, coding kind of, not a competition, but a coding challenge, I'll say. Um, and if there's like spare moments before or after of the problem solve, I'll also often kind of take people on a guide of what I'm working on at Honeycomb right now. So that's particularly fun. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to put your Twitch stream link in there for people. I didn't have that ready. Um, yeah, it's great to see more developers uh, and people doing real, real work uh, showing up on, showing up on the platform. I feel like two willing, years ago. Was nothing. I think it, it requires a willingness of your employer to like commit to the idea of we are going to like unleash some of our secrets, right? It's okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. I've done that a few times. Yep. API keys on the screen. Um, or Kubernetes, uh, you know, connect keys or whatever, certificates, stuff like that. Yeah. I've, more than a few. <laughs> Recently did it on GitHub. I accidentally opened a, opened a uh, private repo unintentionally. That was a fun one. Uh, I didn't open it actually. What happened was I changed the name of it locally and then pushed it, not realizing that that would make a new repo that would be public by default. <laughs> so not oh, in. Oh no. Yeah. So it was just my dot files. No big deal. All of <laughs> all my dot files. Just a few secrets. Um, mostly harmless. But yeah, I did spend a couple of hours uh, in private trying to quickly get rid of all that stuff. Good news is as soon as you put an AWS key into GitHub in the open, within minutes, you get many emails from both GitHub and other organizations that scan your stuff and say, hey, you look like you just put an AWS key in there. You probably should get rid of that now. I think I actually got a phone call from uh, AWS saying, you would put an API key to, uh, on the internet and we were calling you to disable it. <laughs> but they did, Yeah, so really that's, cool. that's actually a fun one. One of the, um, one of the, Things things I did uh, probably about a year ago was I changed this over from hard coded API keys to now you get a twelve hour API key that is only good for twelve hours and it requires being renewed with you logging in with your Google account. Mm. So that that is a thing that I I did for us a while ago to prevent that failure class. Right, like it's defense in depth. It's super important. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And that now and we have the... a dedicated security engineer and they're awesome, but like you know. <laughs> Before that, you had a collection of engineers that are mostly trying to uh, implement best practices on our own. Yeah, yeah, and we we don't think about it on our screens every day. How many how many times on our screen there is a secret <laughs> displayed somewhere? Um, all right, any more questions from anyone out there? Let's see. I think I might have missed one. Uh, Sai is asking: APM vendors are pushing towards full stack observability. What's your take on? Correlating metrics and traces from infrastructure network APM in a single place. Is this the future or just marketing? I think done well, it is the future. Um, done poorly, it is the vendor trying to sell sell you products that you don't actually need in order to inflate their revenue number. Um, so therefore, I don't really like the term full stack observability, right? Like I just like the term observability, you know, full stop, right? right. Full stop observability, not full stack observability, right? So basically, can you get to a sufficient level of granularity to be able to debug your problems in without changing changing product suites or changing or changing tools? Right. That's that's kind of the goal that I aspire to, and I think that you know up until up until June of this year, right, the, the answer was that you needed another metrics tool in addition to Honeycomb, right, because we didn't have metrics in the product. Now we do, but in a way that we think is is the best of all the worlds, right? Like it is enough metrics to help you understand once you hit the, you know, there's something going on in my infra to be able to continue debugging your infra, but at the same time, like not aiming to reproduce all of the Prometheus query language, right? Like I think that there is a middle ground here in terms of, you know, it, it's it's almost like the, um, what's what what's what's his name? The, the person who says, you know, eat food, not, uh, eat, eat food, good, good food, not too much. 
right? I think that the, the same thing is true of, of metrics, right? of metrics and telemetry, right? Like collect collect telemetry, collect high quality, good telemetry, and don't collect too much telemetry. Right. So, you know, when, when you see a, a message about, you know, full stack observability, like think, think to yourself, like who's giving me this message? What are they selling me, right? Like, and what is actually useful to me versus them saying that, you know, hey, like, you know, new NFT dropped, you know, 1% of them are golden, like you should buy a hundred of these, right? Like, wait a second. Yeah, the food mostly plants, not too much. Yeah, that's, uh, is down tip of my tongue. Yeah, he wrote Forks Over Knives, I think. And that, yeah. Maybe that's from that book. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so. Uh, that person. <laughs> produce, telemetry, produce telemetry, mostly traces, um, not, not too much data. Uh, sorry, and you were showing on your screen the blog post. I put that link in. Yes, uh, I was showing the, the blog post coffee. of me working out in open. Because right before we went live, we were talking about another thing that we could could spend an entire hour talking about, which is uh, processor efficiency and kind of optimizing cost, right? So I was talking about earlier the um, what have we learned from Kafka? What have we learned not to do? What have we learned to do? And one of the fun things is that um, AWS announced basically about 20 48 hours ago that there is a new set of, uh, of arm of arm 64 graviton two instances that are storage classes that allow you to have a lot of local NVMe storage and also some fairly high quality, low, low power consumption, uh, processors. And we think they're really great. We got to try them in preview and, um, we are now hundred percent migrated over, which I think is, is pretty fun. Basically being That's, able to. Yeah. Right, like, so when we talk about metrics again, right, like Kafka is hard to manage by traces, right? Like it is understood that Kafka is hard to manage by traces. Therefore, it makes total sense that you would want to have, um, you know, to have adequate metrics to, to look at your Kafka. Okay, so, you know, let's let's actually do that then, right? Like let's actually, let's actually have, have a look at, let's see, can I show some days or is that going to explode one of these graphs? Oh, hey, it, it worked, good. Okay, right, like to be able to see, okay, like, you know, this is what it looks like when we do a bunch of Kafka instance replacements. This is how much lower our CPU usage is now, right? Like to be able to see in one place all of the data about your infrastructure. So having the right tools, that's that's kind of what yeah. matters to me rather than, you know, using one particular vendor set of tools. Yeah. Um, I thought that was really great that you were public about, you know, publicly... I think did you on Twitch you actually shut down the last Intel machine or something like that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. On on Twitch I shut down our la our last uh, Intel Kafka broker. Yeah, that's and and that we and we can talk a whole another show about ARM and the Graviton and I've been very bullish on as soon as Apple announced their M1 chip whatever a year and a half ago I I felt like okay this is this is that and Graviton together are going to change everything and so now in all of our courses now we're we're having to add. You know, making sure everything works on ARM when, when it was really hard to do before, it's getting much easier because uh, yeah, Golang Golang supports cross compiling out of the box, right? Which I think is yeah. amazing. it's not an optional feature; it's just on by default. It's just set Go Arc and off to the races. Um, yeah, and and, and so you're, and a if Go you're Shop. using a JVM app, right? Like if you're using a JVM app like Kafka, it's even easier. Like you don't even have to change anything. Right. It's all in um, the. Uh, I think the show. We had it earlier this year. So for those of you inter interested in Graviton, just search ARM back in this YouTube channel and there will be multiple multiple shows. We had Alex Ellis on talking about all things ARM and ARM uh, Raspberry Pi clusters and all that. And we talked about uh, at least two shows about Apple and my theories on how oh, because right, of when Graviton. M1 released, right? Like, I think that was the other tipping point in people's minds was when Apple endorsed it. And suddenly yeah. Apple was mass selling like ARM chip-based laptops, not just ARM chip-based smartphones, right? Like, yeah. they were like, oh, holy crap, right? Like, okay, now it's time to actually look at this in the data center, right? Like, you know, you're, you're developing, your app is going to have to work on a, a ARM Mac anyways. You may as well run it on an ARM processor right. in the data center. Yeah, I think that honestly, it, it, it's a pain to migrate a little bit, but um, my daily life is now on, a, on an ARM M1. So, you know, if, you know, people are doing it all the time. And I think that that, that awareness of multi-platform, it, it just most developers, you know, unless they're, almost 50 like me they haven't they hadn't dealt with anything before x86 <laughs> so they've not lived it's, through yeah exactly right like there's been this like 20 year like 10 or 20 year window in which in which x86 was you know 99 percent of the market 
right yeah. before that there's this like vibrant question of you know is power pc going to win yeah. right like is yep. uh risk right yeah. is this risk going to win is right like or like remember remember like the windows nt for alpha yeah yeah for alpha chips right like, yeah um, I, I might have actually met, played with one of those servers i think i'm i was back in the navy way back in the 90s but i think we might have had an alpha or was it a what was their their first sixty four bit architecture? Was like IA sixty four was yeah I, Itanium yeah yeah Itanium yeah right like so except for that brief window of like Itanium versus AMD sixty four like there hasn't been processor architecture choice in like fifteen years and now there certainly yeah. is or at least from a commercially viable perspective there's always been these choices right and I think the thing that changed it was cell phones yeah. right like cell phones and really caused ARM sixty four to become important um, yeah. and then and then it became and then came to the to the server farm well congrats to Grav graviton 3 for you because that's exciting and uh i was excited yeah, about graviton hey. 2 and now it's like okay I make yep. it make 60 all things lower power 60 percent lower yeah. power consumption per uh, per unit of compute and also 25 percent faster on average is Amazon's marketing, but we are finding uh, 30 to 35 percent in our testing. And that's the number that I'm allowed to disclose. Yeah. Yeah. All, everybody in chat is throwing in all their uh, all their alternative platforms. Yeah. PowerPC. Um, yeah. Awesome days. Well, uh, was there anything else uh, there in your demo there that you wanted to show off? No, that was it. As like far as the demo, it was like, you know, showing honeycomb metrics, honeycomb SLO, kind of how I debug things. Um, yeah. Oh, great. Um, okay, well, we're gonna we're getting ready to wrap it up. So for those of you out there, since we have like a 30 second lag, uh, get your last questions in for Liz. And what's next for you? Are, are you, you got conferences coming up? Do you got, you're releasing stuff? You're obviously live streaming. Yeah. And... I am, yeah, I'm getting, getting ready to do a couple of workshops and conferences in Australia over the next couple of months. Um, so next week I'm going to be mostly living on Australian time. <laughs> Um, because I'm uh, giving some workshops to some clients in Australia. Uh, it's not too late to sign up. Um, if you go to skillsmatter.com, you can sign up for my Open Telemetry workshop there. Um, although, although it may be inconvenient if you're uh, on the US East Coast or in Europe. And then in January, I'm actually flying over to Australia and spending a couple of months in Australia and working with some clients there. So that's going to be exciting. Um, so yeah, lots of uh, lots of APEC stuff for me in my immediate future. And <laughs> basically, from a professional standpoint, I'm basically trying to help Honeycomb stay on the cutting edge so that we can deliver awesome stuff to you. Yeah, and and writing a book, and um, yeah, because you're you're one of the authors of the Observability Engineering. Who else is on there? Uh, oh, Charity Majors and George Miranda. Yes. Nice. Uh, is this your first book? Uh, yes, this is my first book. Yeah, I haven't done that yet. I'm, I'm very intimidated by it. I, I can make courses, but a book feels like, oh, no, 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 that's serious. That's serious stuff. It's a lot of work for sure. A lot of work. Yeah, uh, especially when they have to get updated. Um, so I, I wish you all of the evergreen yes, we, content. It turned out it got delayed long enough that Open Telemetry hit 1.0. So now at least we're writing against a, stand, a stable API for nice. the instructional content. It's that, that's you know a, a, a very large plus. That's huge. I wish I could have done that with my Kubernetes courses. Yeah, it's uh, always going to work. Oh, except for next month when the new release comes out and then it stops working. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, it's been a lot of fun getting into this, and I'm now excited to get the book and check check it out. I have tried a lot of other platforms, but I've always wanted an excuse to work on a project with Honeycomb. So I'm going to have to come up with one to uh, use myself or convince one of my clients to try it. <laughs> so yeah, convince your clients to try it. Absolutely, please do. Yeah, and of course you can find her Liz the Gray on Twitter, uh, also on same I think right on Twitch Liz the Gray on on yep. Twitch, um, and then on all the anything all the honeycomb things on their website and the blog and stuff. So thanks so much. And next week, by the way, for those of you uh, still watching, next week, let's see, we're having. Uh, oh, um, we're talking about test the test containers project with. Uh, Sergey Ergoff, Ergoff. Sorry if I mispronounced that, but uh, we're talking about that next week, and then we're gonna have some Q and A's. Also on the sixteenth, we're doing our final best of tech show. I'm gonna have a couple of friends on. Um, you probably saw them from last year if you've been around long. Laura Taco and Nermal Meta. 
are both going to be on the show, other Docker captains, and we're going to talk about all of our favorite stuff. Um, do you, quick, quick quote. Do you do you have a favorite thing of 2021? <laughs> Graviton three. <laughs> Honestly, my favorite thing of 2021 is getting vaccinated. That, oh. that is my favorite thing. <laughs> nice. And one day, I hope to be able to return to the real world and meet people uh, in person again. It's going to be yeah. awesome. It's been a Very hard cool. two years for that. Yeah. I'm getting my booster right after this. So I'm going literally from Go here you. to get yes. my booster. So also, I'm excited to knock you on your butt for, for a day just to warn you. That's why I was doing it after the show. <laughs> I didn't want to have to deal with it during the show. Well, thanks again so much. And thanks for all you out there. We will see you again next week here on YouTube Live. Bye. Cheers.